<laughs> Greetings, everyone, <laughs> and welcome to a fearful, earful edition <laughs> of Monster Party. Monster, Monster Party! Monster Party. <laughs> <laughs> I can hear it! I can hear the sounds! Sound. My gosh, it's crazy! <laughs> Choo -choo 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 -choo. Evil ambiance! It goes in the ear and then to the brain, and then it creates a thing that happens, and it's whoa. <laughs> right? Yeah. Right. Oh. Yeah. Woo. Wow. Okay. Boy, well, I, I I sound like Mel Blanc here. Hey, how about you? that? <laughs> have you ever heard Mel Blanc? Because you might, yes, I I have. want to revisit this theory of yours. <laughs> okay. okay. Well, well. Speaking of theory, <laughs> speaking of brilliant theories. <laughs> Who are hello. you, sir? Hello, everyone. I'm Matt Weinhold. I'm Sean Sheridan. I am Larry Stroth. And I am James Gonis. And for this episode. Oh wow, man! Yeah. It, it is it is yet another new fresh concept in a topic. Right, right. new mm. frontier. Yes, <laughs> it is. It is, John. Yes, and it's something that we haven't. We've talked about it, maybe you know, sort of in the periphery. Yeah, but mm. but we haven't focused on it. My right. ears are just important. burning. They're just burning. It's very important. It's a very important topic, especially when it comes to anything film or TV. So. The topic is what is this amazing topic? Sound design. Sound Ooh. design. Hey. Wow. Wow. That was uh that was some interesting sound design right there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we we you kind of blew out, Larry. You really blew out there. Well, man. hey man, that was I'm a blower. That was an interesting effect, though. I yeah, liked I it. It, yeah. it was like you were uh, checking in from the multiverse. Yeah, you might yeah. want to like, might want to tone it down just a bit on the volume, no. Larry. Oh no, no, no! no I got to give it my all, Sean. I got to give wow. it my all because the sound design—it's it's huge, it's amazing in, in the world of science fiction and fantasy and horror. But very but Matt, yes, Matt, who could we possibly get <clears throat> to take us through this world of sound design? Our very special guest is a longtime friend who is making his monster party debut. Get out. Ooh. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> He's an award-winning sound designer, sound editor, sound mixer, and composer who has worked on such genre favorites as Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., the movie oh. Crawl, Black Ooh. Lightning, Raised by Wolves, and a gazillion more. Seriously, if you put his credits on a scroll, it would be longer than a CVS receipt with, <laughs> with coupons. Oh, Ooh, yes. that's long. Yes. Yes. Yeah. But if that were not enough, he was also the sound designer on the much loved Matt Weinhold classics. <laughs> <laughs> Journeyman Project 3, Legacy of Time, and Whacked CD-ROM Games. Well, you're oh, kidding. Yes, oh. yes, yes. Please welcome the genius that is Jamie Scott. Jamie Scott! Thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, my God. We're honored. We're honored. I, I, mean, I should mention that this is not only my Monster Party uh, debut, but this is actually my podcast debut. Is that right? Wow. Really? Oh, yeah, wow. I've been on a podcast. Well, We're you're in for a real treat, sharing. sir. You're in for a right. treat. <clears throat> yeah, Thank no, you. it's all going to go downhill from here. You're changing the next hour. is this? You know, well, nothing will compare. But Jamie, oh. it's so great to see you. Uh, you know, we've been friends for years. Likewise. How, how long did you say that we were friends? Uh, I think we date back to 1995 oh when we started God. working on the Journeyman Project games. That's, oh, wow. That's like a million years ago. Yeah, it is. With, <laughs> and, with, and, and, uh, and, and looking at you, you haven't changed a bit. So I'm feeling like a little, uh, <laughs> a little self-conscious here. But um, yeah, that was at the very start of of my career. So. Yeah. And look at you now. I mean, the things that you've done, we're we're all very proud of you. We oh my really gosh. are. Yeah. And Jamie is doing the show from his, of course, his sound studio. And that's why we're getting such wonderful sound. You got the, you, there's no echoing or anything like that. He knows his stuff. He does. And <clears throat> speaking of knowing his stuff, if you could, Jamie, give us a little bit of a sort of a history of how you got into this business. And then maybe a little bit about, what it entails. 
Well, uh, on your very uh, kind and gracious uh, introduction, you had mentioned that I was a composer. And while that is no longer really the professional case, uh, that was uh, the case back when when we first met. And that was, yeah. um, I had gone to school for uh, jazz guitar, of all things. Oh, wow. And, uh, now I see uh, it. I see it. So, you know, connecting the dots um, right out of college, I had an opportunity to work on some multimedia things uh, that was, you know, CD-ROMs were starting to become a thing back then. And thankfully, I had paid attention in my composing classes because uh, there was an opportunity for someone to write the music for these little, you know, games that would accompany like those um, McGraw Hill textbooks. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. CD-ROM <laughs> companion. Right. So I worked for the company and then somehow magically I got involved with Presto Studios, which was my first like really legit production job. And Good times. Um, Gundam 0079 was my first project with them, but that was like a really quick thing. Uh, it was like two months of work and it was we got to do everything on this game in uh, two weeks or two months and get it done now. So I did that, but then I settled in and we started with the German project three. And that's when I actually started to experience what it's like to be a professional sound person. Wow. Okay. So when I watch you work, for example, there was a time not too long ago when I was in your studio, we were doing some other related kind of work, but you were doing the sound design for, I believe it was the movie Crawl. And right. it was very interesting to watch you because it was like somebody composing. It was really like somebody writing a song, the way that you put these sound effects and you hit these moments in the scene that I was watching and really brought it to life. And I'm assuming that's the thing that really keeps you coming back to this job and, and enjoying it so much that a lot of it really is like composing. Yeah, it is. Uh, you know, I should I should say that I have a, a you know a tremendous passion for this work. I mean, I'm so stoked to get up every day to be able to do this kind of work, and it's just it's such an honor and a, and a thrill to be doing this work. And it is an extremely creative thing. And I think um, you know one of the things that a lot of people don't realize is that when you watch a movie or, or you know go to the theater or even you know watch something on TV, everything that you hear, pretty much like every single thing from, you know, the guy lifting up a cup off the counter to, a you know, 60 foot monster roaring, <laughs> like blistering your ears. Um, all of that stuff is made up that none of that stuff wow. is really recorded on the microphone that you sometimes see dripping down in this frame. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or you used to now they just right. erase well, that anymore. British TV. You know? <laughs> British TV. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so you know, it's 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 a, a tremendous craft to be able to create those sounds and and you know put them against picture and make it so that it's a believable experience. And a lot of people um, in my world say that if you've done your job correctly, then people don't notice. Right. It's, yeah. It's only when the sound sucks that people notice. Yeah. Oh, well, I think I think especially especially though in genre and you know in the stuff that we love, like genre films like horror films and sci-fi and fantasy films or television, especially so much of the sound has to be made up because there are no such things as those sounds. You no. know, and just right. creating that entire all-encompassing kind of atmosphere is really a key, obviously. Exactly. And, and I think a lot of people are sort of, you know, starting to wake up and, and understand that a little bit because, you know, now we're in the world of podcasts and we're in the world of, you know, Zoom calls and people yeah. trying to make themselves sound good over these, you know, crappy computer speaker mics and, um, <laughs> right. you know. Maybe yeah. starting to realize that, you know, maybe there is, you know, some craftsmanship into, you know, what goes into this. But also, but also, I think to me, like, it's just like sound is just can be just as memorable as visuals, you know, sure. when you're, when you're yeah. experiencing something, especially as a little kid, you know, like when I was watching, growing up, watching a movie. I mean, just like as an example, like monster sounds, you know, mm. like in old old movies, <clears throat> especially growing up when you certain films they have a particular sound of some creature or some something happening that that is so unique and sticks in your mind. I mean, just as an example, Godzilla. Well, Godzilla, of course, any kind of creature sound like Toho Studios created a whole like landscape of different creature sounds for all their monsters. But I'm even thinking of like when I was a kid watching 
the fifties sci-fi movie, them, mm-hmm. you know, and nice. it's, it's about giant ants, yeah. but a key part of the suspense in that film is not seeing the ants for a while, but you hear their sound yeah. and it's this weird, like, I mean, I can't even like reproduce right, it, but right. it's, that's pretty I think, good though. I think it was something that I remember reading. They kind of took bird sounds and messed with them and stuff. And this was in the 1950s too. This is before digital and all that, but you heard that sound and it, you know, this little girl in the film who was traumatized, she hears it and she freaks out. It just really affects you so that when you, you associate that sound then with the horror and the suspense and the monsters and it's, it just sticks with you. Like as soon as I hear that now, I know what it is. Yeah. That's a really great <clears throat> example of, of what we try as sound designers, we try to do. And, and, you know, that's kind of the goal. The ultimate goal, if you will, is to create a sound that sort of lives beyond outside of the picture. You know, you think about Ben Burt's work on star Wars, you oh know, my God. Like, yeah. Mm, I mean, you know, like, R two D two, you know, that's pretty much part of our American vernacular. Oh you my know? God, those right. sound, the, the lays, the blaster sounds, the lightsaber sounds, like they're ingrained in our brains now. I mean, it's just, yeah. it's incredible. It's same with like the original Star Trek, all the sound effects sure. on the bridge, all that stuff right. is just like you know it, like you just know it so much, so well. I love it when somebody brings something new, like Star Wars didn't try to copy. The Star Trek phaser, they came yeah, up with their own right. sound. They didn't use like canned, canned like audio effects right, or like, right, or like yeah. generic, you know, public domain effects. Like they create a whole new sound, you know. For- it is now familiar. It's like a friend. Right, right. Mm. Warm and fuzzy. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, I love you know, the, Star- it's, it's- the Star Trek phaser is almost oh. like a purring cat in a way, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it, that's kind of one of the reasons why I kind of stopped doing music and got into sound was because when you're writing music, everybody's got an opinion. You know, you're sitting in a room with, you know, 20 cooks and everybody's yeah, sort of got an idea of how the music should go. Whereas sound design is like, I don't know, do what you say. <laughs> and right, so, right. you know, there was like this whole level of freedom to sort of create a vision and and follow through on it and do things that maybe might be unexpected, but are, are kind of unique to, to something that, that I would think of. Right, right. And that's why it's called sound design, because we're actually designing this stuff. We're sitting and we're putting, you know, sort of like this experienced concept to work. And we're coming up with things that we know will work psychologically on an audience, things mm-hmm. that, you know, um, have sort of a signature timbre to them, things that, uh, you know, fulfill the story and, and make the story more effective. A lot of it really is very subliminal. I mean, it's true. That's one thing that you're not necessarily supposed to notice and i guess if you're doing it right then it doesn't stick out but it does work on a subliminal level and most of the time you don't even know it's working so you take it for granted yeah 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 exactly and and i you know i'm very much into the psychology of sound i think about it i've been thinking about it for 30 years you know just you know the uh, the effect of choices that i make on every single little thing. I know, you know, exactly how to scare the crap out of people. I know how, <laughs> people, how to pe- make people cry. You know, I know how to make, you know, do all these like techniques that I've just sort of learned over time by doing, it's my bag of tricks, man. I know how to yeah. make people cry too, but it's different. <laughs> what, pulling nose hairs? <laughs> it's, it's, it's just my, my actions, you know, <laughs> letting people down. <laughs> so, Jamie, could you tell me, I mean, I know that you're a sound designer, but for people out there, I mean, the world of sound, back in the early days, there might have been one person that did sound. But nowadays, there's so many people. There's sound designer. There's sound re-recording mixer. What, what's the difference between the those positions? Oh, that's a really great question. I love it. I love it. Um, so, yeah, sound is, is a very um, vibrant field. And it starts with the sound supervisor. The sound supervisor is the kind of the person that controls the sandbox. Mm-hmm. They are the ones that interact with the director, talk to you know the producers, and get an idea of what they want this thing to sound like in general. Mm-hmm. And so the sound supervisor is sort of like at the top of the food chain. And from there, you have all of the editors. You have the dialogue editors. You have the sound effects editors. You have the Foley editors and you have the sound design editors and there's uh, different levels of editors. So, and those are the people that prepare the content to be ready to be mixed. 
And then at the end of that chain, you have the mixers who are the guys that sit at the big mixing consoles. They're not so big anymore. Well, they're still big, but you can actually do them with a smaller console. But um, they're the guys that take in all of the different pieces from the editors and they mix it in with the dialogue so that the dialogue's always legible. And then they mix in the music so that there's like that emotion with the score and then they have the sound effects and then Foley and you know it's all it all comes together at that stage and then you have the QC operators who are another mm-hmm. whole thing which I won't get into but uh. no but you mentioned so this you know, the director or the producer would talk to the the supervisor I mean we who knows what let's say a laser cannon sounds like or a Tyrannosaurus Rex or <laughs> right. what, do, what does it sound like when something explodes in outer space you know that kind of stuff and and then it's up to the the sound designer to kind of do his interpretation based on what the director and the producer se- you know describe to him, right? But Absolutely. sometimes a producer director will like like you said earlier, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> what do you think? And so well, that's when a designer goes goes out there and finds tries to find things that he thinks he might might work. Yeah, and that's where you know what, that's where it becomes really creative and and. You know, one of the things I love so much about working in sound is is it's really a, a blank slate. You know, it's f- sort of a f- fresh palette of what you can do. Um, you know, Gary Rydstrom made the Tyrannosaurus Rex sound like, you know, this m- massive monster. But, you know, research shows that they actually kind of sounded like birds. But he went with, you know, this effect of like creating something that is horrifying and so he right. you know he's using like lion growls and elephant hoots and and you know like layering it all in so that it's just this big you know massive wall of sound and you know sitting in front of 85 decibels of you know massive speakers it's going to scare the shit crap out of you right yeah <laughs> well i mean it's like uh it's one of those things too where it's like do you want reality or do you want effective right. exactly right well, right. it's 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 funny. I mean, you mentioned Gary Reitstrom. I mean, he worked under well, you guys mentioned uh, Ben Burt, who did Star Wars. And I remember seeing a thing when they're saying, "Well, what does a laser sound like? What what is this big furry Wookie? What's he supposed to sound like?" <laughs> and there was like this a, a really amazing story of how he went to the zoo to try to listen to a bunch of animals, and he couldn't really find anything that he thought would work. Then he went to there was like an animal farm. And there was a bear that was going around in his cage. It was kind of constantly growling. He goes, ooh, that sounds interesting. And so we recorded the bear. And then he went to, I guess it was like SeaWorld or Marine Land at the time, I think. And there was a walrus that his pool had been empty because they were cleaning it out. And the walrus was sad. It was like making all these <laughs> groaning sounds. And so we recorded walrus and bear. Hey! So, yeah. <laughs> so it was a combination of uh, that then he recorded a bunch of dogs growling, whimpers of dogs and lions, but mm-hmm. it was the walrus <clears throat> and the bear that he used that really primarily made up Chewbacca. And I think that's just amazing how you oh, just yeah. take all that stuff and blend it all together. Well, these are the iconic people of history that have built up the you know excitement and the language of the world that I now dwell in. And you know, there's of course, huge reverence for, for these people. Um, you know, they they created this world out of their own imaginations. And and those of us who are working now are sort of following in their footsteps, you know, purely based on inspiration from those people. And I'm one of the, you know, very lucky people to be working at Skywalker Sound now and being sort of fully immersed in the, those creative geniuses. And they're still all there. Mm. Wow. So, Jimmy, let me ask you, like, in the digital age today, do you still kind of like seek out sounds and nature and in the real world or as opposed to how much you do digitally and with with your actual effects and machines? I mean, do you still, you know, like go out to record an animal or something, (laughs) you know? That's a great question. I I love that question. Um, So so basically you collect sounds, all sound designers, we collect sounds, whether it's, you know, we buy them from from somebody who recorded them, or we go out and record them ourselves. You know, I've been collecting sounds for for as long as I've been working. And I still use sounds that I recorded 25 years ago. Um, And and what we record and, and how we use those recordings defines our style as sound designers. Mm -hmm. So, but, you know, we're living in a time where there are, there's a whole climate of 
people who go out and record things and then post them online and you can buy their packages. Oh, yeah, okay. right, right, right. So I, I, I have a sound library that has literally a million sounds in it. Wow. 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 And and it's all, you know, all on a you know really big hard drive and I can access them, you know, immediately. And I kind of use sound, you know, that's been recorded, who knows where, but what I can, what, what kind of like my secret superpower is, I can take something so random and twist it into something that totally works with picture, mm-hmm. you know, nice. mm-hmm. uh, like crawl, you know, that's a really great, great uh, example. You know, I, I would do, I did like a lot of the sounds for when they're like crawling underwater. That was the alligator, right? Alligator. Right after yeah. them, yes. right? Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and, you know, uh, whipping their tails and things like that. And I'm not using the sounds of alligators. I'm not going to go out and record an alligator, you know? It's like, <laughs> you don't go underwater. That's a wasted day. Like, really? to, wait, to, wait, to, to wait for an alligator to say something. Or... Yeah, like, I'm going to get on a plane and fly to Florida for a week and sit there right. in, in, a, in a musty swamp getting eaten <laughs> by mosquitoes with microphones trying to record yeah. a tail whip. Dude, dude no, we're losing daylight. That. I'm going to, what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to take some, some, you know, actual bull whips, snaps, and, you know, combine it with the sound of me pulling a chain through a towel, you no. know? Wow. <laughs> like, All right. Okay. So I'm um, cool. In regards to that. How often do you find yourself with all your sounds that you've recorded and collected? Do you also do Foley of any kind or like, have, have you ever, how often do you get in a situation well, where you feel like, I've got to create this sound myself. Right. Well, let me back up and, and sort of describe the differentiation between Foley and sound effects, because I, I don't think a lot of people really get that. Please. Yeah, yeah, please. So a Foley artist is a person who deals with the physical uh, aspects of a person's movement. So whether they're walking or they're throwing something or they're knocking a, a cup off the table, they're going to perform those actions fresh because they don't pick those stuff up on the microphones you know when they're recording things on set they're just getting what they the dialogue is you know what they're Mm. saying out of their mouth because the microphone's pointed right at their mouth so the foley artist comes in and they replace all of the sounds and so you know next time you're watching a movie and you see somebody like throw a a bottle of beer at the at the wall you know you got to realize that that was actually somebody else after the fact (laughs) re-performing that and then putting it in fresh in the movie so (laughs) where the the dividing line between foley and sound effects happens is something that they kind of can't do like if uh you know somebody like uh a car crash Right. You know, they could mm. they can uh, drop a, you know, a metal door onto the ground or something. But if you really want to get the the squeal of the brakes and the, you know, the slide and then all of the impact and the debris and all that stuff, that's something better left for sound effects. And then obviously, once you start getting into genre stuff, it's like, right. oh, we need we need uh, mother to scream so loud that these people's heads explode right. you know, okay well sure, that, right that's a whole nother level of design that we need to <laughs> that we need to consider creatively i love right, that right. sound by the way i really <laughs> love that sound no, i i know of what you speak i know the show you're talking about and that yeah. is so creepy yeah that was uh that was a, a, a labored sound what, a, what yeah. about like um like raised by dialogue. wolves Yes. Oh yeah, incredible. yeah what about like diet like i know like dialogue or when somebody has to sound different like, for example, like I always thought Frank the Bunny in Donnie Darko, the way his voice is so, the bass, it's so low and it just like, it just gets into your head. Like it's it's, cr- it's scary and creepy just the way he talks. Yeah. Obviously that was accentuated and, and designed, but that that's something too, right? There's something to that when, when you, or, or a super villain in a movie that you know has to have that booming voice well what about like bane bane from the about right. you know? <laughs> no, don't use that as an yeah. example well, well you know, that bane, yeah. no but can yeah, you but imagine just... no 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 john can you imagine that's just it you know it's like all right and action and all you hear is what the hell is he saying what line is he saying i don't know so you've got that but then do you like gotta re- record that or i don't know 
That's... Well, you know, challenging conventions. I, I love it. I love it that they took that chance with Bane. I, I thought it worked really <laughs> well. Um, you know, not a very popular opinion, but at any rate, um, you know that that is actually something that that very frequently falls into my domain because mm -hmm. it's like they'll have a, a you know a dialogue line that they want to sound like creepy or big or small or like a chipmunk or whatever. And so then I, you know, will take that and I will design it. You know, mm -hmm. um, sometimes the dialogue team has a designer on like a dialogue designer on their team. Bigger teams kind of have that, but uh, sometimes smaller teams that that falls into my domain. And, you know, that's the fun stuff. I love taking like something like I remember I, I worked on this one thing where it was this sort of voice of God. It was disembodied. And it was like this, you know, very deep kind of godlike thing. And, um, you know, they gave me like the, the the voice actors stuff. And it was like, and it sounded, it sounded good. It sounded like this, you know, something, it was deep and, and kind of like that. But then I decided that, okay, well, I want it to be like swirling all around the room. So what I did was I, I copied him like a bunch of different times with my own voice. You know, I just, I just like got all the mm -hmm. phonemes lined up perfectly and I, you know, processed them all differently. And then I swirled them around the room and then I added reverbs and all kinds of stuff and, and nice. you know, really made the design for that kind of voice, um, you know, as something like that's, that's really huge and makes a big impression. It's the type of thing that will make a scene pop. And I don't want to take <clears throat> anything away from, you know, the wonderful cinematographers and set designers, but. This is so important to yeah. having a film work and having mm. a scene work. And when there's one of those moments where you go, wow, I really am now in a, another world. It's that one extra step that yeah. puts you in a brand new place. Well, all, you know, all the big tentpole movies these days are like that. And, and it's not just sound, it's it's the visual effects, it's the tightness of the editing, and it's, it's all of the elements combined. And... Um, I know for sure because I'm I'm working on something like that right now. And to see these movies without the visual effects, <laughs> with, you know, just the set sound and all these things that you don't that you somebody would never see or or hear right. in the final piece, it's laughable. I mean, it's just, it's, like, <laughs> it's, it's actually horrifying to watch. It's like this is so ridiculous. Right, right. And, yeah, there's so many layers. So sudden, you know, over time it just comes together. And, you know, and like from my perspective, you know, creating the sounds, it's like, you know, all of this is the sounds, they they lock into place and it feels tight and it feels emotional. The music comes in, there's the subtext and then like the visuals come in and it's like, you know, it's it's a lot different from watching a guy walk around on a green screen, you know, all of a sudden right. they're in space <laughs> or whatever they are. And, and it's like, it's completely transporting. And, uh, you know, that's, that's how movies get so immersed. It's just layer after layer of creative yeah. contribution from large teams of people. Yeah. And it's must be the same thing when it comes to writing. It's like when you start that project and you've got the footage and you know, you're know you ready to start your part of this. It's like looking at a blank page and, <laughs> right. and, and how great that is in the sense that, wow, now I can create this whole new world of my own creation but also it must be a little bit intimidating too to like well you know, where do yeah, you start I mean, writers have you know the world the responsibility of the world in their hand you know and and the best and most successful writers are the people who take these things into account you know people who who write things that have sound in mind you know the things that like yep. <laughs> are part of the experience and and you know and the same is with visual effects you know it's like you know, and it, it it's it's a little more than oh he reaches out to grab a, a thing, but it's like he hears something like emanating from around the corner. Right. So he looks around the corner and then he sees the uh, glowing obelisk. You know, it's like those right, kinds of right. things. Good writers really, you know, include the senses, and and you know the best writers really focus on how sound affects their story. Well, you know, uh, a, a perfect example for me, and now this might be also with music but and i know we've talked about this before but when you saw the original trailer of star wars mm, right, had that right. different music mm -hmm. it yeah. was kind of ominous a little bit you yeah. know yeah. It was, it's it's it was like a, a whole different movie yeah, yeah. Mo it still looked great and interesting mm. but it did not i don't think prepare anyone for when you sat down and watched that movie for the first time 
and this onslaught of the music and the sound effects. And I know that it was a quite a task making Star Wars the hit that it was when it came to editing the film in general, but then adding all the layers of sound effects and music. And I don't think that, at least around that time, I don't remember seeing anything like that or experiencing anything like that before that I could recall. Well, you know, I, I, again, you know, we, we all bring it back to Star Wars because, you know, that's like the the iconic sound film for this generation for and probably future generations. And one of the things that George Lucas did for Star Wars that was kind of out of the ordinary was he brought Ben Burt on, like, I think before they started filming. Oh, oh wow. And, you know, started describing concepts to him you know, hey, you know, so we're going to be shooting, you know, these these big beasts. I, I really would love to have, you know, have it sound completely different than, you know, what what Warner Brothers would do. Right. You know, right. so Ben was actually working on creating these things like while they were shooting and throughout post. And so, you know, that's why all of that that sound stuff has such great attention to to creativity and newness to it. I heard a really interesting story about how, so where did the, the sound of the lightsabers come from? And he, he actually said it was, it was partially, he had an old TV set that when you turned it on, I guess it had the tubes or something, <laughs> and it had like a hum to it. You know, that was part, that was part of it. And yeah. then um, there was a, a, another piece. It, it was like the TV set, he would have it tuned in between the channels and then there was also a sound of an all 35 millimeter projector. Somehow he combined the two to create the lightsaber sound. And then how about the great lasers? Where the hell did you get that? And there's this footage of him out in the desert where there are these uh, giant uh, metal uh, like electricity or uh, telephone things. And, and there are these long wires that – that are like it, it's like they're like, like long cables. metal cables. Yeah. Yes, Sean, they're cables, and yeah. you, he recorded hitting them or tapping I heard them. This, yeah, and yeah. you no. could hear it. You could hear it. It wasn't quite. You could kind of hear the sound of the laser, but he would manipulate it, sure. modify it, or whatever to create the sound of these wonderful lasers that now we all take for granted. But right. you actually had to go out and discover that they're alien sounds, robot sounds. Where where do you get a robot sound? You know? Yeah, this is this is the the the. Uh, the stories that in 2000 years, there's going to be, you know, a new religion, a new Bible that, you know, it's going to start out with the book of Ben. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. Fingers crossed. <laughs> you know, and but you know, the, the, these are the lore of my world, you know, and um, yeah. we're, we're very lucky and blessed that these people are still alive and still active in, in the sound community. And they're also very um, kind people and they, bring up people they teach their craft to younger people and that's cool uh, that to me that's that's a, a wonderful thing and, and that's sort of where i'm getting in my career is is i've learned so much i'm starting to get to that point where i want to teach people and i want to tell people the stories of sound and and uh and and make sound a more tangible thing in people's right. lives <clears throat> did remember, you have um, a mentor like that or um i've had you know, people that have graciously lent their kindness to me over the over the years. You know, I've never had like a like a, a like one guy. mentor. Just yeah. people that would like hire me for things and tell me that it sucked, and then I would have <laughs> right, to right. go back and try to please them. And, and and through that process, I would learn. You know, I would get sure. better at my craft. So, so you didn't have your own Obi Wan Kenobi. You had a bunch of you had a bunch of them basically. Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> well, you know, Negative about, reinforcement. <laughs> you said Sometimes, how, yeah. How Star Wars, you know, is a great sound film. <clears throat> I remember somebody, I don't know, it was a review or somebody was talking about how they had a, a friend of theirs who was blind, but that friend loved to listen to Blade Runner over and over. Oh, mm. because oh yeah. Because just the combination of the music and the sound and, and just the rain and the, the city sounds and all and that Vangelis music, it all just it's a movie that you can just literally listen to, you know. Yeah, you know, I, I think <clears throat> we tend to fall back on talking about Star Wars because it's it's the most knowable kind of yeah, sound experience. Yeah. But there's a million films with incredible sound design that yeah. you know that I listen to. I, I, you know, for me, Star Wars is kind of like um, I don't know. It's, just, it, it's old old news. I mean, I sure. I, I appreciate you know things yeah. that are far yeah. more nuanced and 
and thoughtful. Um, a million films come to mind, um, you know, like The Conversation. Yeah. I, I saw my list. Yeah, I mean, that, yeah. that movie, I mean, even though it, it was, it's kind of a genre because it's thriller, it's murder. Right. Um, but that movie, which is about a sound designer, that movie is so brilliant because the plot involves recordings and the inflections of people's voices. And it's just, yeah. it's, it's so immersive right. and it's really brilliant. Yeah, Walter Murch is is kind of the you know the original gangster sound designer yeah, in our world, yeah. and uh, you know it, you know everything from um, Apocalypse Now to everything that he's done recently. It's it's all just been sort of a, a lifetime of of brilliant, thoughtful, insightful sound design, and yeah, uh, you know it, it isn't frequently as flashy as right, you know, right. like a robot sound or a or a lightsaber, but man, it's boy, immersive. It's a, a punch. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. If listeners haven't checked out the film The Conversation, I strongly recommend it. It's it's it, you know, yes, there's this interesting murder. Where is this going? And it stars Gene Hackman. This is Francis Ford Coppola directed, correct? This yeah. is his yep. script his script. Yeah. And it's it's fascinating. Maybe not as fast paced as today's films. No, it's but like it's a, a character study. It, of this but guy. it's it's so well done and actually very uh, uh it's it's creepy. Yeah, it, it is. Yeah. Yes. You, you just don't know where this is. When I saw it for the first time, I thought it was going to go one way, and it totally surprised me. Yeah, so, yeah. And you're right, Sean. The sound plays a very important role. So that there's is- a De Palma to a lesser extent. De Palma did it with the movie Blowout, uh, yeah. which was a uh, Travolta, John Travolta as a sound designer, sound recording. Who he records a car accident, and it's like if you know, it's it's a blowing out of a tire, but he realizes there's another sound there. It's a gunshot. It was a murder. You know, and again, you know, just where the sound becomes a kind of a character in the movie. You yep. know? Right. These are, these are brilliant films, all, you know, great examples of what I was talking about earlier, where the scripts use sound as a, a storytelling device. And you know, for, incredible. You know, for me though, I mean, we, we talk about star Wars, but actually to me as a kid, the very first film that I saw that really blew me away as far as sound, how did they get all this, was actually the 1933 version of King Kong. Now, oh, the guy the yeah. guy who did that oh, yeah. sound, uh, Murray Spivak, guys, mm-hmm. you have to understand, they didn't have a lot of different positions for sound. It was like one guy. Right. And it's like he had to come up with, what does King Kong sound like? What does a brontosaurus sound yeah. like? Oh, what does it sound like when a brontosaurus knocks over your raft? And and what you know, what are all these sounds like? And and the funny thing is, not only does he try and find these sounds, but he's actually recorded himself. To me, yeah. one of the most <laughs> horrifying moments in the film is where there's a guy who's running away from the lone guy who's running away from the brontosaurus. Ooh, the vicious brontosaurus. And he climbs up <laughs> a tree. And then the brontosaurus tries to get him on one side and on the other side. And you hear him. When the brontosaurus grabs him, he does this blood curdling. Ah! Ah! <laughs> Well, that was Maurice Bivak. That was him. That was his wow. cry. He did a lot of his own. He's trying to say to himself, well, what would I sound like if I was being eaten by Brontosaurus? <laughs> right. And and I and I and I love that. But even Kong, uh, I mean, and again, as he's doing the the sound research in 1932, it's a combination of like bear and lion. But he mixed it together so well. Especially the fact that sound was kind of new to film. To yes, begin right. with. Yes. Yes. I mean, that's, it it you know. was. I mean, and that uh, the, the sound throughout that entire film, you know, it just, just blew me away. Because yeah. to me, I really thought, and that whole fight between Kong and the Tyrannosaurus Rex, I thought that's what Tyrannosaurus Rex is sound like. You know, yeah. Yeah, that, I'm so glad that you know these things. I mean, these are these are like the iconic moments in my world. And, and it's, <laughs> it's exciting to hear other people talk about them because I get the same way when I talk about them. Some of the iconic moments in sound in my world, you know, happened in the 80s and 90s when I was sort of like discovering the world. And Terminator 2, man, that was oh, like, you know, hmm, when I yeah. saw that, that like that changed the game for me and, and, mm-hmm. and Aliens. You know, that was yeah, a, yeah. those two movies were like, this is what I want to do. I want to make sounds like this. I want right, to like right. be involved in movies that pack this kind of punch and that like make things so exciting. And, and you know, there was a lot to be said for what was filmed in those movies. But without those soundtracks, man, they would have been a drag. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. And and uh, talk about 
a sound that's another character, the sound of the aliens, especially when it came to that sort of clicking, which was also very iconic to Predator. But yeah. uh, <clears throat> but that clicking sound, and then you also have the wet, crackling, mushy yeah. body yeah. horror yeah. sounds. Those those, uh, those machine guns. Those... Yeah, oh yeah. yeah. Sure. Just the, the sheet of of sound that you like uh. sounded like death. You know, on the <laughs> way. Like, yeah, right like you're, you're, in, you're in the middle of the war. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Even like even but even like on a low budget end, like horror wise, like the original Evil Dead. You know, uh, which just com- tons of weird, spooky sounds, but even like kind of crude to a point. But because they were like that, it worked, you know, and right. it just it throws you into it. You know, Sean, they yeah. altered voices too. remember when the yeah. creatures oh, yeah. in the, I mean, in that the, was all, eh, y'all all die, you know, and they're, yeah. he's, she's under the, the in which, the cellar. Which, which again, probably like Jamie's saying on the set when actually filming it is not nearly as no, dramatic, no, no. That was, you know. That was all the work of a guy named Alan Howarth, who was, uh, he, oh, yeah. he all, oh yeah, he did all of John Carpenter's movies. And, yeah, uh, he's a composer with him too, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he does a lot of music as well. And, and right. I've always admired him. He's he's wonderful. And and I believe yeah. Frank Seraphine did quite a bit of work on that stuff too. But yeah, um, uh, yeah I, I, iconic work. I love all that stuff. So Jamie, coming from a, you started as a composer and coming from that background, I'm curious when it comes to film scores and, you know, like the, the way that films are scored, like in click tracks, do you ever find yourself at odds with the way a film it, where music is supposed to come in, but it might intrude with what you have in mind that might be better than music in the, the design mm-hmm. of sound? And film? You know, I, I love, you guys asked the best question. That is, <laughs> That is such a great question because, you know, that that is a very pivotal question in my world. And that is the role of sound and the role of music. And believe it or not, that changes over time. You know, what used to totally rely on music now has sounds. And, and you, you know, you have directors like the Coen brothers, you know, it's like No Country for Old Men who there's no score in that movie. And yet it is the most mm-hmm. tense movie you could ever imagine and it's all done with sound and things you know like that where we show up on stage you know we're all sort of working independently composer is composing his grand piece of music for the scene and i'm composing my wall of sound that no music could possibly get through (laughs) and and it's sort of like worked out on the mix stage you know it's like everybody's got an opinion but sometimes you know, they uh, they let the sound effects play without the music. And, you know, the director will say, God, I just I just love how the sounds without music. What if we chop the score here? Mm-hmm. And I have been in the room when that happens so many times now. And I think it has to do with, you know, how the aesthetic appeals to different directors, you know, like a, a Marvel movie. You know, no, you know, they just sort of depend on the music constantly pulsing right. and everything's mm-hmm. bigger, right? But, <laughs> but less budget dependent movies really have the opportunity to sort of let the sound do the, the storytelling. And I love moments like that. To me, those are, you know, they, they make life worth living. I wish oh, that like- was more a prevalent opinion you know like i wish that i wish that there were more movies because and i think it's kind of coming back but there was a time when just music just saturated everything and i love it when you got a movie especially when that sound design is so great where there's a very minimal musical soundtrack and you just get sound effects and and sometimes it really pulls you in especially the type of movies that we like you know, right, right. horror and thriller. Sometimes that really is the key. It's somehow more intimate. Somehow it brings you yeah. in. Yeah, but I, like I you're think there, also like you're experiencing yeah. it. No, I was gonna say that also when you combine a when a soundtrack kind of works both as a soundtrack, music soundtrack, and a special like a sound effects track. Because, like for instance, back in the fifties again, Forbidden Planet, you know, was kind mm, of true. groundbreaking with this electronic score, but it was also an like ambient mood score as well it kind of worked there were sound effects in there or even like on television i don't know if you're familiar with jerry anderson's shows like space 1999 and ufo these are from the 70s early late 60s early 70s like the show ufo 
Barry Gray was the, the, the soundtrack, but he also designed the sound for the flying saucers, you know, <laughs> yeah. like, and he combined all that kind of with the music. So sometimes the music and sound effects overlap. Was it a theremin by chance? I no, don't know. it was like, it was just kind of like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, but it's very unique and you, as soon as you hear it, it's, it's, it sticks with you. You but know, there are there are a million stories of music and sound conflicts on on the mixing stage. <laughs> um, I've got a bunch of them myself. I, I won't, uh, you know, I won't go too deep in name but, names. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I've I've been in situations where um, you know the composer wasn't in the room while we mixed, and <laughs> they would come in for the playback, and it was really uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and also I've been in situations where, you know, the sound design would win the conversation and right. the composers would uh, flip out. And, and I've, <laughs> I've actually seen composers leave the shows. Wow. wow. It's, it, you know, it, it gets heated in these things. <laughs> it can well, get really, really emotional. Well, it's funny you bring up composers. Sean had mentioned a very famous sound from a very famous film that involved the composer over a sound effect. And that was uh, from 1954 Godzilla and the iconic Godzilla roar. Yeah. I mean, when you listen to that Godzilla roar, which is still used today, yeah. Yeah. Uh, people go, well, what the hell is that? You know, what is it? Well, it's a combination of a lot of things, but the story mm-hmm. goes, it's, it's kind of like this, this myth in a way that, the sound guys that were hired to create the Godzilla sound went, they went to the zoo and they tried to listen to all the animals to try to find something and they couldn't find something or nothing was that alien or that monsterific, you know? And it was actually the composer, Akira Ifukube, who mm-hmm. actually came up with the idea. And, and the thing that gets him is, when he was hired to do the music, these guys don't get very much time to do the music. They, they get a very short amount of time. So he has to do the music quickly. But when it came to this monster sound, he, what he did is he, or as he says, for the Godzilla roar, he took the lowest string of a contrabass and then ran a glove that had resin on it across the string. And the different kinds of roars that were created they were created by playing the recordings of the sound that he made at different speeds. There's another story about how they actually had a production van and how it had like a kickback and, and they would run it forward and then in reverse. And so it was a combination of, well, I think it's the sound of the truck and the sound of this musical instrument. But uh, what's, a, what's a contrabass? It's, it's, it's the kind with the it, big mouth that that yeah. eats the the smaller fish. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Isn't it like a like a uh, like a like a big a, bass? A type contra of thing? a yeah. contra bass. Is, oh, bass. Is, is oh, stand okay. Up bass. Stand yeah. up bass. Oh, I, I I thought yeah I thought maybe you like you you no, hit no, a no, bass no, with a hammer. Yeah. <laughs> And, but, but that could work yeah. too, right? But, yeah. but, Who's but to anyway, say what's wrong or right in this? But here was a composer that actually came up with the iconic sound of Godzilla. I just that's thought great. that was I love that. Show. I actually yeah. didn't know that. That's that's great. Um, you know, I'm actually uh, good friends with the, the 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 guy or team of people who put together the new Godzilla. Oh, cool. Um, mm-hmm. You know, there are, there are certainly traces of that sound. Well, you know, it, it, it's funny work. because they said that they were able to recreate it on their own, but they wanted there's the sound different oh. so they did variations but they would they said that they will take it to the grave as to how they made <laughs> the new <Yeah>. Godzilla sound <laughs> oh. wow, it's I probably bet. something like yeah they just you know found the sound and and used the pitch shift on it and <laughs> <laughs> they called it a day and they but just it, don't want it to think that it was so sure, unlabeled. Right. no i'm kidding i'm kidding i'm uh, sure but, they put, uh, <laughs> but, but it's <laughs> funny that here, it. whether it's whether it's star wars or forbidden planet or King Kong or Godzilla, there are certain sounds that we've heard that were created years ago that resonate so much today yeah. and, are, and, and are just so fantastic sounds. Uh, one of the uh, many mentors in my world was a guy named Steve Flick, who uh, he won uh, an Oscar for his work on RoboCop. Oh, uh, cool. great yeah. sound. Yeah, great yeah, yeah. Sound. He, He's amazing, you know, and I, I kind of grew up knowing, knowing about him peripherally. So when I actually had the chance to meet him, it was really it was a kind of a funny story. Um, I got put on this this show from a mutual friend and Steve Flick was the uh, sound supervisor. And I'm like, 
oh my God, this is amazing. It was like, <laughs> uh, you know, so uh, I was put on the show and then like two hours later, he calls me. He's like, who the hell are you? And why are you on my show? <laughs> it was like one of those don't meet your, uh, your wow. heroes moments. Oh. But, uh, you know, I was just like, well, Mr. Flick, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a long time admirer and, and I, I'd, I'd really love this opportunity to work with you. And from that point, you know, we became like, you know, friends to the end. And no, that's good. Like, that's good. Working, working with him and, you know, hearing his, his library of previous stuff and, you know, just all those iconic sounds that he did for RoboCop and, uh, you know, Indiana Jones and, and all this stuff. You know, he's, he's truly a remarkable creative uh, benchmark in, in the world of film sound. Wow. Now, I did have one interesting question for you, Jamie, and that is because some people on the outside, they may have heard about this, but maybe you could give us the inside scoop. What is the famous Wilhelm scream? Mm, yeah, right. I mean, what is, what is this? It goes back to like the 30s, right? Yeah. 50s, well, or 30s I mean, or 50s. You can look it up on YouTube. I mean, the history of the Wilhelm scream is it, it's silly and it's ridiculous, but it was actually <laughs> brought to brought to the world's attention from Ben Burr mm -hmm. um, of, with his use of it in pretty much everything he did. Um, and then it's since morphed into this sort of weird. Maybe it's a joke that everybody uses it. I've never used it in anything. And in fact, I've fought against directors who have demanded it. <laughs> demanded it. Um, wow. Yeah. Really? Yeah. So um, because for it, it, for it's not my joke. Yeah, if for listeners, if you don't know, it's a famous scream where you hear the guy go, ah! And I think it was like a Western or something. It was, originally, from, wasn't it was it? from, it was first used in 1951 for a film called Distant Drums. Okay. Oh, mm. okay. And then later it was used for a movie called The Charge of Feather River. And so in that movie, there was a private named Private Wilhelm. And so that's what it's named after. And it was like a stock sound effect that everybody just kept using. Effect. But no, yeah. but but the stock sound effect, it, the actor's name was she, uh, Sheb, Sheb Woolley. Sheb Woolley. Sheb Woolley. Sheb and Woolley. so and so the funny thing is, this guy who did this scream, this scream is used and it was used in so many of these films, like in the Indiana Jones was. But uh, Sean, it's in them. It's oh in really? Them. Oh yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. As a matter of fact, if well, you if know. If for listeners, if you check out uh, on YouTube, if you check out the Wilhelm scream, there's like a series of just nothing <laughs> in a variety. Let me see if I can get it. Hold on. So here it is. Ah! Oh, uh -huh. There it is. That's there it, it is. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's the sound. It's like it's like the it's like the audio equivalent. He's like it's like the Alan Smithy of audio uh, design. <laughs> when you hear that song. And also another connection to Monster Party is that Sheb Woolley was also known for the 1958 novelty song, The Purple People Leader. One of uh -huh. my favorites. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a toe tapper. It really I is. One, one, really that. one horn flying purple people. <clears throat> That's the one, yes. I love and, it. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, I guess the scream has been used in countless films, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, it, I was, heard... it was a Skywalker joke. You know, Ben Burt used it in a bunch of things, and then Gary sort of took it over. <laughs> but, you know, the descendants of that joke, you know, it's it's so overdone. It's so overused. Uh, you know, it's it, not funny. It's not, it's not our joke. You know, we need to come up with. <laughs> we, 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 need a, so. we need a fresh, a fresh Wilhelm scream. <laughs> yeah, right. No. Okay. Yeah. Well, wait a minute, then. So, what about the Howie scream? The what? What's there's that? one. I looked this up, and there's one called the Howie scream that I guess was used in uh, Broken Arrow in okay. 1996, and that's another scream that is sort huh. of. From what I read is like, it's the new competitor. <laughs> Ooh. Okay. But can't we just have new screams? Do we need to catalog <laughs> yeah. every scream? I mean, well, you do, because you'll take it, Jamie, well, and you'll well, make well, something so, new out of it. Well, here's the thing. Every sound designer has their own joke sound, right? You know, we right. all have one. And what is yours? it's one of those things that we stick into everything we do. And uh, I'm, I'm, I have certainly have a, a small pocket full of those sounds that I put in every and if and if you're familiar with my work you know you know what it is but uh, most people will never be that intimate with my work so well apparently Lucasfilm came out with a statement back in 1998 saying we will no longer be putting the Wilhelm scream really? in Aww. any of the Star Wars stuff John Favreau in the latest he has it <laughs> he uses the oh, Wilhelm he goes, well I'll show you I'll <laughs> and he That's got kicked funny. off the ranch, didn't he? 
<laughs> I, I, I don't know. I, I don't That's know. But J- Jamie, has there ever been a sound effect that you had to create that was really difficult? Like something that you just you could not get or just it took forever to kind of get right? Or, or, well, or the, produ- the, the filmmakers didn't like until like a million tries? Or uh, There's a lot of like very high pressure sounds that, that I've had to come across um, in my time. And, and there's always, you know, there's always uh, sort of a little give and take in terms of creative interpretation. You know, I mentioned earlier that that scream for mother um, in Raised by Wolves, when she, you know, screams and liquefies everybody in front of her, that was that was a very labored sound, not because they demanded it to be. They were happy with, you know, the little ostrich call that, that you know, what that the editor, picture editor put in. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I wanted it to be something huge. And so it was it was on me and I put in, all of the extra time to really go for something that I wanted it to feel like it could actually liquefy a human. <laughs> right. And no, uh, it, it, it's, it really works. It's, <laughs> it's scary. Thank you. You know, so, so those kinds of, of sounds, you know, I, I tend to work really hard on because, you know, they're signature sounds and they're, you know, I have my own artistic integrity that I want to, to bring to the table. And, and I, I really um, kind of, do my best in those situations. Jamie, one question I, I have for you too is, have you ever gotten to the position where the producer director says, all right, buddy, you got a week or you have like a couple <laughs> days or you have a short amount of time. You're like, I, for, for what you want. I mean, that's, it, it, it's impossible. And you have to make a priority list or does, does that ever happen to you? And you have to like quickly whip up stuff. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, a mercenary when it comes to sound. And that's just comes kind of comes with the territory of living in LA, being a freelancer, um, you know, going from job to job and, you know, people, yeah. they just want things fast and, and furious. And, uh, you know, so a lot of times it's at the expense of the artistry. Um, yeah. So I have to sort of put my, you know, my artistry in, in my back pocket and just do what I got to do to get through the, the day or the week or, or the month, you know? You know, Matt and I, we worked at Playboy TV and there were times yes, we when, did. We, there were times when our poor sound designer, we had to come to him and say, okay, look, we need this in three days and I want this and this. And he's all, and I have three days. <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> look, I can do this and I can do this, but everything is going to be really difficult. So you just had to kind of pick and choose what's the most important sound. What can you kind of lose? And, and uh, because things take time. Yeah. And for Playboy TV, man, they, they were (laughs) all about, this has to be perfect. Yeah. This has to be. Yeah. I mean, and if it wasn't right, Oh, you had to just keep doing it again and again, because they wouldn't stop until it was perfection. Yes. This sound, this sound. I can only imagine. I, was gonna, sorry, I can only imagine how many uh, buckets of Jello were used in the sound design. <laughs> <business before. laughs> how do you know these things? <laughs> well, well, you know, uh, Raised by Wolf season two was sort of a, a lightning fast nightmare like that. Um, not nightmare. I mean, I, I still had a lot of fun doing it. But, you know, I worked on season one for like almost over the course of a year. And then season two, I had five to almost you know with revisions it was like you know six days per episode and these are hour-long episodes with just jam-packed from start to finish with you know constant effects and you know a lot of it had to be new and original so i was you know i was working 13 14 hour days to get that done for two months straight and you know by the end of it it was just like i need need a break i need a change (laughs) And I'm sure it's that same kind of thing when it comes to writing too, once again, where you're working on something and there comes a point where it's like diminishing returns where you're like, I think I got it, but maybe I'm, I'm concentrating too much on it. And so when is it done? Right, right. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) You know, it's funny. We, we talked about sound and kind of the fantasy world, you know, science fiction world and horror where you can kind of make up stuff. But sometimes it's it's difficult when you're dealing with the real world. There was a, a time when I when I was working at Midland Productions and we had to, we were doing a film for SeaWorld of San Diego. 
And the sound designer is a brilliant guy named Red Kleiss. And Ren has got, went on to do sound design for the yeah. film Seven and The Game. And he's been nominated a bunch of times. And now he's working at Pixar. But at this time, we needed sound of like a humpback whale. And so Ren found these great sounds of humpback whale. But we kind of needed a little kind of need a little peek. So he he played this sound design for us. And God, it sounded great. What a great sounding whale. And, you know, we submit it to the SeaWorld people and they're going, that's not a humpback whale. No, no, it is. It is a humpback whale. What he had done is he had taken sounds of a humpback whale at the beginning part and put in a little killer whale sound and then finished <laughs> with a humpback whale. And oh. the SeaWorld people got it instantly. Wow. Fooled us. We had no idea. And they go, you wow. changed that. You, you changed that. <laughs> it's so yeah, you, can't wait, you can't wait with that like I, in some sci-fi movie. But not. Yeah, but not <clears> I love nerds. I love nerds of any <laughs> time. Not when you're dealing with oh, excuse real- me. Look, if when you're trying to, if you're doing a nature show and you need the sound, here's the sound of the muskrat sure. or the sound of the sure, frogs. Yeah. It's like you better have the sound of the muskrat and not the not the beaver. You know. <laughs> you know, I, I I adore Ren and I always have, and but I've never I've never actually met him. So now that I know that story, I'm gonna yeah. have like you know a conversation opener because I actually did work for SeaWorld. and no and way, wow. I had a similar experience. Yeah. Now, I figured we could talk about because this was back in 1992. So I figured it's been a long time, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> we got we got it taken care of, you know, so I, but, yeah. we may have uh, we may have intercepted because that was when I was working on that stuff. Well, maybe really? it was 94, but yeah. Wow. Good times, man. Good times. <laughs> totally. It's true because like, I like I like it when you see little kind of experimental things done with sound like uh, the movie, uh, jo- the Joe Jante film. The Howling. I mm-hmm. mm. uh, love that movie. I've seen it a million times. And, you know, sure. but if you watch that movie, the opening credits, as the credits are playing, you're just seeing like visuals of like a TV monitor, static monitor. It's supposed to be in like a TV station or whatever. Yeah. And just the credits are going over and you're hearing some of the stuff from the TV, but also mixed in is all audio from the from the whole film. That, that this comes up. You hear, you hear little snippets of dialogue, almost subliminal, that – later play out all the way through the whole movie. So you get, which is really cool, which I never noticed before, but it's, it is almost subliminal, but it kind of like, it's creepy and you start to hear a little bit of the, of the cast. You know, it's pretty cool. Actually, I haven't watched that since it was in theaters when I was a kid. So I'll have to go back and check that out. That's really yeah. interesting. Yeah, yeah. That's a really talking good about, time um, movie. Yep. Talking about uh, whale, whale sounds, one blockbuster pre-Star Wars that always impressed me in the beats and the editing and the sound and the music was Jaws. Sure. It's starting from the Universal logo, where it seems you seem to hear this sort of underwater sound. You don't even know where it is, but it it automatically puts you in this. You know, you're not really sure uh, where you are. It's unease. And then, I mean, I love the score. I love the film. But what I also love is the silence, like how the yeah. silence itself plays into the editing and, like, in the moment before. The shark jumps onto the boat and eats, you know, Robert Shaw. There's just, oh. this, just, just a few seconds. Okay, spoiler. There's a few few seconds of silence, like a, a beat of just silence. Mm-hmm. And so, sometimes these scenes, they work wonderfully because there is no sound. There is no music. Yeah. There's no sound effect. And that's part of sound design as well is the lack of sound. The absence. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's it's just a big palette, right? You know, and what you do with every moment uh, is the design of it. I love the use of silence, man. I I wish I had more opportunities for it, but you know, a lot of directors won't let that happen. Sure, you know, it's like joke writing or joke delivering. Actually, it's yeah. timing, and hmm. to to have a a sting with sound work in the way that you want it to is almost like hitting that punchline perfectly well yeah you could use it in, in in a very effective way like the movie um a quiet place you know which is all about being quiet and silent oh, right. so when you do hear a sound you know it's like it's just jarring. although they do get pretty loud in that movie everyone should be dead <laughs> well yes well, true. They, I mean, they make a lot of fucking noise <laughs> the creatures they like, make a lot of mistakes right trying to be know, quiet but but, but yeah. yeah i love that movie and, and the sound uh eric at all and uh Ethan Van Der Rijen did, did did the sound for that, and it's just brilliant. I think I believe they won an Oscar for it or something. But um, the you know I can I can never think about that movie and not think why didn't they just 
fix the frickin' nail, man. (laughs) 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 True. Very true. Right, right. You have the time, right? I mean. (laughs) Right, right. And then you have the hammer. You know, yeah. the hammer, just well, very, you, very well, quietly. It, just t- 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 <laughs> Jenny, yeah. Jenny, if you tap it, you're going to make some sound. Yeah, so yeah. that's not good. Hey. But but I will say this. A lot of that movie, like when they're walking on the sand, that's some that's done by a Foley guy. Right. Or someone yeah. when you're watching someone with like footsteps or and crushing walking through the sand and stuff like that. That would be yeah. a Foley person. mostly. Yeah. You know, it's funny that the travels of Foley these days, and, and at least this is in my experience, is sometimes it's like we'll get the stuff from Foley. And, you know, we'll shape it during editorial. You know, sometimes it's like, you know, like a recent, a really good recent example of this was uh, Without Remorse. I don't know if you've seen this. It's a Tom Clancy thing. Um, okay. And, uh, you know, there's he, where he's he's like stealth walking through the through this apartment and the camera's right on his feet, you know. And so it's like the footsteps have to be perfect. So, you know, what I got from Foley was like clump, clump, clump. But, you know, we're not going to hear the impact because he's like, you know, softly laying down his foot. So right, I'm right. like, you know, when I'm editing it, I'm e- editing out the the actual impact so that we just hear like the soft. And then I'm taking like wood creaks, the sounds of wood creaks, and I'm layering those in so that you hear sort of like the impact of those steps, like in the world. And then I'm mm-hmm. adding reverb to those things. And then I'm adding like cloth movements. And, you know, so there's like this evolution of what comes in from Foley what I do as a sound effects editor to amplify that and make it work in the scene. And then what the mixer does to seat that in that world even better. So, you know, Foley is like a, it starts w- in one place and then very frequently ends in a very different place. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Have you ever worked on a film where it was just sounds, no music, the whole thing was just sound? In my mind, every one of them. <laughs> ah, yeah, right. right. Interesting. Yeah, uh, you know, it'd be interesting I, then to take your movies and remove the soundtrack. And oh, if you want the stems, I'll give them to you. you can <laughs> <laughs> make make me a mixtape. <laughs> a mixtape <laughs> with a little heart on the yeah. You know. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thunderclap because of your breakup. <laughs> <laughs> There's there are you know very frequent examples of I've done such compelling sound work that we foregone the music. I think we've we've talked about we talked about that earlier, um, but never like a whole thing. Um, you know, someday maybe I'll be lucky to work on something like that where you know uh, a director has you know, a very specific vision um, for you know. Ha- I remember there was a. Uh, an episode of murder, murder in the building, um, where they didn't have any talking throughout the entire episode. Yes, yeah. You know, it was like it was sort of like a, an interesting uh, take mm. on on something like that. So maybe maybe I'll land in somebody's uh, feather cap and uh, and we'll do something where it's one hundred percent sound. I would love to see that. Is is there any sound effect that you created out of the blue from nothing that you're like the most proud of that had the most fun doing? Like what, some kind of just strange of sound. Um, there was a lot of that on, uh, the show that I worked on called black lightning, which was like a, a WB superhero. Oh yeah, right? yeah. yeah. And, um, unfortunately the director was really into the, into music and he, I don't uh. think he really gave sound effects <laughs> much, a much of a, a second thought. So everything that I did for that show was just sort of, uh, washed over with music but if you take away the music man there's some really great work in there that you, know, <laughs> you should have just like on his voicemail just like drop these sounds <laughs> hey this is jamie <laughs> hey jamie you mentioned- coming up next in episode three <laughs> <laughs> you know jamie we had mentioned some we have mentioned some films but you said that you had a, a million great films or, or films that had fantastic sound and sometimes it might be a film that it's not a great film but might have a lot of great sounds in it can you recommend some other films that you think the sound in this film is just amazing this if you're interested in sound check out this film and they can be good ones too they can be good <laughs> or they you know what genre that might be your favorite or, yeah. yeah yeah you know i i like i like everything I'm, I'm one of these people too who will find something to like in in pretty much everything that i watch and a lot of times the sound if it's really helping the story that's where i get the the biggest thrill out of the sound job you know it's like i don't really listen for oh that was a really cool effect or 
uh, or that kind of thing. I'm, I'm, I'm listening to sound as a whole and, and how it impacts my experience of the, of the film. Like the tapestry of the yeah, whole thing. Yeah, exactly. The, the whole thing. And, and that includes music. It's like how the music is used, um, how, how loud the Foley is, how loud the backgrounds are, you know, at any certain part, how sound is used to build tension um, and without using the obvious crutch of music building up or whatever. Right. You know, I like those. Those are the kinds of things that I, that like, I get really excited about, um, you know, when you ask for examples, I, I wish I had like a shotgun ready for you because, but I don't, I, 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 I don't well, have like that. Well, when you see, when you memory. go and see a film, are you able to divorce yourself from the, just concentrate on sound? Or are you able just to enjoy the film or can you not help yourself and go, Oh <laughs> yeah, that sound. No, no, I, I'm, I'm all in it for the sound. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Try- it drives my wife a little bit nuts, you know, but I'm just like, oh, did you hear that whole part? And she's like, no, but I like the movie. <laughs> right, yeah. right, right. You know, when we discuss older movies on our show, we will sometimes be concerned with recommending them in a way that a younger viewer might still be attracted to it. Because there's one thing that you have to do when you watch especially like older science fiction movies is you need to be able to watch them with the eyes of the past. Yeah. And that so, time. Yeah. Right. When it comes to special <clears throat> effects, you got to re- you realize, okay, this is all they could do back then and appreciate it for that. Are you able to go back to older movies where the sound design must be really primitive? And I'm saying something not even as sophisticated as King Kong, but just for the time, for what they had to use, you know, enjoy it for for what it is. Yeah, oh. like even like bad looping or something. You know? Right. Yeah. Like like that you saw a lot back in, in the day. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I, I I'm actually really good at that, and I I'm a, like a Criterion Charter member, so I like <laughs> I spent so much time watching old movies, and a lot of it is from that perspective of just you know really understanding the tools and and the techniques that they had at their disposal and you just it's it's it blows your mind i remember i was watching recently this movie um i wish i could remember it was a french movie about a guy trapped in jail during world war ii and the whole thing is from the perspective of him sitting in this cell trying to escape he was like carving out a little wedge in the door and it was guarded by nazis but there was a window uh, a cell window and like the entire thing is told by the soundscape outside. Mm, it's the cool. most amazing sound work I, I've heard in a long time. I can't even remember the name of it. I'm sure somebody listening to this will be like, oh, that's the French film. Yeah, let us know. Well, those kinds yeah. of things. And, and they have less to do with, you know, the techniques of creating sound and more to do with the conceptual construct of how these sounds roll out over time and, and the impact that they have emotionally on the characters yeah. and the storytelling. Uh, yeah, storytelling uh, literally with sound. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. pretty cool. Oh, I love one it. Film, um, one film that I think it was an Oscar winner uh, that had a lot of impact that came from its sound was The Exorcist. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah. And, and I, read a, I read a series of books by uh, an author named Wilson Brian Key about subliminals in media. And he did a whole chapter on The Exorcist and some of the visual subliminals, but also the audio. Mm-hmm. And I don't know whether I believe a lot of it because I. one of the things he said was that Friedkin put in the sound of bees, like swarming bees. That's it, right. It, because that would make subliminally, that would make you want to run away. That would make you terrified. Right. Yeah. Now, wow. I, I, I listened to the movie with headphones. I could not hear bees. <laughs> so I don't know. And, and he also said that there were images in the in the breath in the cold room with where they and I didn't see anything, you know, so it's like, but at the same time, well, he's smoking. Yeah. I, <laughs> well, I, you know, I, these I, are these are now tried and true techniques of of building up, you know, soundscapes with, you know, with uh, preconceived attachments to them, you know, and, right. and, and I'm, I'm guilty of doing that all the time. I was working on something and I don't remember. It was like this harrowing scene. And like I put in like a little crying baby, and the supervisor was like, "Dude, you're like, <laughs> going for the gusto there, aren't you?" <laughs> you know? But as, but as far as as far as putting in sounds that you think might work on a primal level, it, but under the surface, so you might not know that you're hearing that. 
Right, yeah. Right. And, and, you know, sometimes it's more effective to use those sounds in a very, you know, subtle way, like, you know, like a, a lion growling you hear in every creature in every, you know, big movie that you hear now it's, it's or whatever, you know, right, but right. if you put like a, you know, if, if you're in a, an environment and you hear like some soft purring of, you know, guttural purring, it's like, that can be like far scarier than the, the primal scream that, that, you know, follows yeah, it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Like, especially or, or like in, ghost films or paranormal films or, or even creatures like, like the descent, you know, the cave dwellers and des- the descent yes. make yes. such weird kind of yeah. clicking weird. I don't even know how to describe the sounds they make, but they don't sound like anything you've heard before. And it's so unnatural that it yeah. really freaks you out. You know, I remember really being affected by those sounds. Yeah. Those are cool. Yeah. Or the Texas chainsaw massacre, the original, the door um, slamming. The, the door slamming. Yeah, oh Simple God. thing like that. But it's, it's, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Such a mundane sound, and yet so horrifying. Yeah. 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 And cr- the creaking and the chickens and, oh. oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, all that stuff. I know. Even like, I mean, an old, this is a film from the 70s. The, uh, it's like one of the first big hit, uh, like Bigfoot movies, uh, The Legend of Boggy Creek. It's a really low budget movie and kind of looks like almost like a documentary at times, but all the sounds of the swamp and all the wildlife that was kind of that you're just immersed, you know, oh, in, in yeah. the world. I mean, and, and you hear these kind of very distant echoey kind of guttural kind of roars or growls of the Sasquatch apparently, but like it really is effective. It's just and, creepy. Uh, Dawn of the dead. All these moaning zombies in the back. The old yeah. one. Point. Yeah. The, original. the, the, yeah. Yeah. the shopping the original. mall one. Yeah. Yes. yeah. I, very I, yeah I spent a lot of time in that movie. Yeah. <laughs> And I know that there are a lot of people who have a pet peeve with this when it's like you hear an owl hoot or, you know, a wolf will howl or a Or lightning like, or thunder. Right. But it but it'll be like, okay, there would not be an owl in that area or, or not be <laughs> right, an right, owl, right. you know. Yeah. And I just I, I love I, once again, I love persnickety nerds who watch a movie and go, uh, there wouldn't be a loon there. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> right, right. Eagles in Hawaii. Yeah, I, I went to that. <laughs> I was working on uh, Cameron Crowe's movie Aloha, uh, and uh, oh. you know, and and there the, uh, the picture editors soundtracks came in, and there was a bunch of like uh, seagulls in there, and um, so I actually you know hired an ornithologist <laughs> to wow. like from wow. from Kauai to uh you know consult on that film and he's like there's no seagulls in hawaii (laughs) i'm like what no yeah no seagulls like okay Mm. wiped out that whole thing (laughs) so never hire an ornithologist is what you're saying (laughs) (laughs) always hire an ornithologist okay okay (laughs) what i think sometimes I'll, i'll belabor you know backgrounds like that you know where you know I'll have dozens or or hundreds of layers of elements that make up a background and they're all sort of strategically placed, you know, um, in between lines of dialogue or if it's a, they're just walking through, you know, it's just like, I'll have their footstep affect something like a, you know, a, like the, if they snap a twig or something, I'll have a bird fly off. Like, oh yeah. You know, like this oh, this right, world right. Is, is alive, you know, those kinds That's of cool. things are really thrilling. There is a movie that I did when I was in college that uh, is available right now on Patreon as part of (laughs) Monster Party Masterpieces. Ah. But it was a film that I did called Mad Myron. And it's a it's kind of like a Revenge of the Nerds thing. Did you direct it? Yeah. Oh, directed it and uh, did a little bit of acting in it, did the editing. And uh, And it's 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 done like a horror movie trailer. And it's about a serial killer who is this, you know, your typical bespectacled nerd who gets harassed so much that he finally becomes a serial killer, but he's such a nerd and such a loser that he's not able to do that correctly either. <laughs> so, a Leslie uh, Vernon kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, but it, you know, I thought it was pretty fun, but it was. Uh, so when it was we fun. were trying to come up with the sound effects for that movie, there's a scene where there's some kids that are attacking Myron and I use this crowd sound. It sounds like it's a crowd. And then you hear someone say like, Eddie. So we used like one of the kids yelling and we put the Eddie kind of in his mouth. You know? <laughs> but, uh, but then I'm watching, this is Spinal Tap. 
and it's in that movie. I'm like, wow, <laughs> these, these, these sound effects get around. Wow. <laughs> nice. Fun stuff. Yeah, there was a there. There's a uh, several like old libraries that became what you call stock sound. Effects, yeah, you yeah. Know, Hollywood <laughs> Edge and Sound Ideas and those kinds of you know companies that were around back in the 70s, 80s, um, and they they just kind of live on, you know, as cliches. Yeah. And um, you know, those of us who have an ear for these kinds of things, it's like you know, as soon as one of those things plays, like in a major motion picture, you're just like. Quick. Yeah, I mean, like the sound, really? like, there's, like there's an old sound effect of a car crashing. It's like, yeah, you it's just a famous a sound. Times, yeah. yeah, or like, or like you know, on laugh tracks, you hear a particular guffaw yeah. or right. like, right. 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 Yeah. a million times. And or the like red a, tail hawk, the yeah, right. you know, yeah, any, yeah, any yeah, desert totally. scene, and the the Doppler truck horn by, yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah. You know, Sean, I, the but, but English Sean, one too, right? The, but, uh, 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 yeah, yeah, absolutely. But Sean, there is a sound effect that I I love to listen to, and sometimes when I'm in my place alone or something, I will turn it on <laughs> and listen yeah. to like the big applause for like 14 minutes. It's, isn't that it, isn't that scary? Jamie? Warm applause. He's and I, it's like, I imagine I'm up on stage. Oh I'm God. waving. And, Do you also you know, have a boo for that? Also, <laughs> yeah. no, no, Sean. Why would I have a boo? No. Why would I listen to? I, I should, maybe in your world, I should say anything. You, I should like come over to your house with a boombox. <laughs> why? Why would you? Why would you crush me like that? And I'm, I'm just saying, it's a, it's, it's a fun sound effect. I, you You're know, like it's like Rupert uh, Pupkin you, from. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's this, uh, this fun, funny sound nerd story here, actually. Um, so there's this crowdsourced uh, library that um, Tim Nielsen, who is a, a great supervisor, he works at Skywalker. Um, he sort of organized this thing. And basically, you know, he got on the, one of our, you know, frequented news groups and said, hey, I've got this idea. Why don't we crowdsource an ambient sound library? And so basically, oh. if you contribute to it, you'll get it for free. If not, you know, we'll we'll sell it for the X amount of money and, and give it to, to a charity. So he did that and he got like thousands of entries. And so unfortunately, wow. I was too busy. I couldn't do it, but I bought it. And so I have this library that was recorded from, you know, people all around the world, wow. all walks of life. Hmm. And they're all really high quality recordings. And some of them are, you know, 20 minutes long. Some of them are, you know, five minutes or whatever. But I'll just go through and listen to some of these things. And I have found some of the most remarkable stuff in there. Like the other night um, I was on I was talking with my Slack group and this guy's like, Hey, check this out. This is from the crowdsource library. And he like pointed it out. And it was like these people getting like in this gnarly fight, like with cops coming and like, you know, you could hear people like getting smashed up against cars and stuff like this. Like, wow, this is intense, man. <laughs> All from just like letting mics roll from around the world. That's like one of my favorite things to do now is listen That's to that. That's cool. Show. That's cool. Oh, when Matt and I, when we were working at Playboy, there was a show that Matt was in charge of. It was a great show called The Stash. That's Very right, funny yeah. show. And uh, we never had to do canned laughter because the audience reacted <laughs> to, to really well to all the jokes that Matt and his team had put together. It was really funny. But, but they did ask me. As one of the producers, they said, hey, you know, can we can you just have the audience just just so we have it, you know, do a series of laughs. Let's right. just do a chuckle. Just do a laugh. So I went out, you know, to the beginning, go, hey, folks, we're going to do this. And just having the record, you know, telling the audience, it was kind of fun. It was exciting because that laughter, that laughter or the little chuckle or the laughter and applause, all that stuff, it was this was fresh. This was new. It wasn't anything that was canned. And it was, it was great. It was really fun that, and we had it, but we, Madam, we never really I needed don't it, did think we? We ever needed it. No, we yeah. did it so we had it, but it, no, because the show was actually, it was a very funny show. Are you guys familiar with The Laugher? No. No, what's that? Okay, no. so uh, The Laugher, they, there are several of these guys, but the, the, there's one like prominent guy who in the 80s would, you know, go from studio to studio. And all of these sitcoms, he would just basically sit there and add the laugh tracks. He would set up his little, some, like a rig of some like sort of library right, yeah. of recorded stuff. And he would perform laugh tracks to all of the sitcoms or whatever. Really? And, uh, he'd make a killing off of these things. And he well, because it got, yeah, and it got sophisticated. It got better after a while, too. Like, like, like you watch the sitcoms in the 50s and 60s, and, and, and it's, it's so, it's, 
Then as in the 80s and 90s, they got it was still a laugh track, but they got better. It got sounded a little more natural a little more and more realistic. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I only learned about the laugh the laugher like a couple years ago. A buddy of mine, Charles Dane, was telling me about him because he hired him to come in and, and work on his uh Penn and Teller show. And uh, he was telling me all about the history of this guy. And I was like, that is fascinating. I always figured it was either recorded live or it was, you know, just like a library of things that they would sort of sprinkle in and post. Right, no, right. It was like one guy it was the running track. around town every day, all day long, add laugh tracks. The thing. Sounds, sounds cool. like a DC supervillain. The laugh. <laughs> the laugh. <laughs> yeah. It does, Sean. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, well, it's like that scene in any hall, right? With uh, yeah. Tony Roberts and and he, and uh, Woody Allen sitting in on a session, yeah, where that's, that's that, yeah. adding laughter right to a sitcom. Yeah, that's why yeah. I got. That's why I said that joke to, to Larry. He's like, "Do you have any booze in there?" Because there, he's going <laughs> in. There, he's going. Oh, I had a chuckle right here. I had a bigger <laughs> and like and like Woody Allen's so disgusted by the whole idea. Like, Do you have any booze in there? You throw in. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what if you made the I'm, jokes funnier? <laughs> I'm just surprised that you would ask me. Do you listen to booze? It was yeah, a joke, Sean, Larry. Yeah, when I want to. It was a mean Mr. joke. Mr. Literal, it was a joke. <laughs> yeah, no, it's all about attacking you, Larry. It's all, yeah. You see, you see, you, th- this is what I have to put up with, sir. This is what I, I have to I don't up. know you well enough, or I'd be attacking you too, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> see, you, you, in, you intuitively feel the vibe of this show. Oh, I could, I could really, I could really use that, uh, that laugh track right about now. <laughs> you, can, you can use the Wilhelm scream right now. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny the whole the whole laughter thing that, that yeah. i i think that that's fa- I, I always thought that was fascinating back in the day when the early days of sitcoms people thought wait a minute let's put in laughs so people know when to laugh like well that's uh, but, so ridiculous but, but sean i mean the, like something like i love lucy that was shot in front of a live audience no, I know, that was, was real right, laughter right, right. But, but are but you then, talking like, something like my three sons or yeah, something, or yeah. or something. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you, yeah you need a laugh track for my three yeah. sons <laughs> 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 laughs are far right. and few I know but, it's, uh, it's, it's no Hazel, is it? It's no Hazel, no. But <laughs> right. I, I remember, so I'm a big Hogan's Heroes fan. And so I yeah. have, I love Hogan's Heroes and I have them all on DVD and I watch them repeatedly. And what I didn't realize is that there were a couple episodes where they got rid of the laugh track. Oh, okay. And it was interesting to go back and watch the ones with no laugh track. And I, you know what? I hate to say it, but I kind of missed it. Yeah. Well, the odd couple was the same way. The odd couple had both a live audience, then they had um, an obvious laugh track at some seasons, and then I think I don't know if it was a whole season or some episodes. I think didn't have didn't have laugh track just, at all. Just a couple episodes. Yeah, a laugh yeah, track yeah. That. And it is weird. It's an odd. I mean, that's the thing you get used to because you grew up. You know, right? It's familiar. It's comforting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's like thank God that we've evolved to the point where the laugh track is obsolete. But I wonder if there never were a laugh track how it would be now, you know, cause True. it's like, okay, well we've evolved, but without it, what would it look like now? We don't, we'll never know, you know? Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I will say, I will say this because uh, Jamie, I have, I have a, a young daughter and when she was growing up, we would watch a lot of Disney channel stuff. And I know what you guys are saying about my three cents stuff, but when you try to watch something like, dog with a blog or or you know uh, <laughs> the, the, some of these shows yeah. from uh, like the 20 2010 period it was like there'd be a little smart ass comment and then there was a guy who would stick his finger on thinking oh, 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 you know for everything and yeah. you as an adult i'm like oh my god my head's gonna explode but my kid <laughs> right. loved it i guess maybe that's where she's trained that oh well these shows and as you grow right, up they have yeah. laugh tracks <laughs> Oh, that, for my kids, a, it was it was Foster's Imaginary Friends or House of Imaginary Friends. Did you guys ever see this? Not that. Mm-hmm. Foster's not, not Home that for that Imaginary one. Friends. Yeah, there was this uh, annoying character called Cheese, and he, <laughs> it was the most annoying character in the in the history of cartoons. And <laughs> for some reason, both my boys just gravitated to that, and I was like living in the house of Cheese for years. <laughs> oh, wow. yeah. uh, the wonderful world of sound design. <laughs> yes. Yep. Now, Jamie, before we wind this thing up, mm. you know, I'm sure that there are a lot of people out there right now listening who are as fascinated with what you do as you are. And maybe they want to get into this. Uh, you know, how difficult is it to break into something like this these days? 
Uh, it can be very difficult. Um, it can be, you know, luck lurks around every corner, right? Right. I think the the real measure. That's what, is, that's what I've been told. <laughs> <laughs> I think the real measure is is sort of um, the desire, and and that's what I look for when people approach me about with that same question is is you know um, there's aptitude and then there's desire and then there's experience and and you know I think the core is like how badly do you want it I mean how how compelling is this work to you um, yeah you know it's yeah. it's not easy work you know, I work hard. I, you know, just like most people in production, um, I work long, hard hours and usually exhausted. Um, but, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you know, there's that, that feeling of completion and creative ownership and, right. and those kinds of things that, that keep me sure. going. Um, <clears throat> something, doing something creative for a living is always, that's a plus. To living your dream. Exactly. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. To be sure. real, you know, and yeah. I think it, it it took me a while, honestly, to realize like the creative potential of sound design, because like mm-hmm. I said, I started out sort of as a composer and, um, you know, sort of dabbling in sound effects because I had to as part of the job. Right. Um, but then eventually I got the bug and realized, wow, I have a lot of you know, creative license here that I w- don't in, in music and, and I want to do this. And so I think part of it is, is, you know, coming across that realization and coming, you know, and getting the, the passion and, and the desire to do it. And then it's just a matter of learning the craft, learning the skill. Right. And, yeah. and that's <clears throat> when things get a little bit difficult because you can watch YouTubes of people doing it and learn a significant amount of thing. Um, you can watch the, I used to call them DVD extras, but now I guess they're sort of just YouTube uh, behind the scenes kinds of things and, you know, watch director commentaries and, you know, those kinds of things. You can learn a lot about, you know, a director's use of sound and their intention of, of how they go about uh, designing sounds for things, but there's nothing better than hands-on experience. And I think, uh, Going to school is one thing. There's there's some craft schools like I, there's a, like the Savannah College, and there's like Full Sail, and I know there's one in Vancouver. So there's like more and more opportunities to learn this craft before actually getting into the professional world. And then once you get into a situation, then you can sort of like learn from mentors and people higher up and sort of evolve into this kind of thing but it's a it's a journey it's not uh it's not as goal oriented of a profession as i think a lot of things are you know because i'm always learning and i'm every everything i do is is a new opportunity to better my craft and and learn new things and uh, have new ways of, of expressing uh my skills so you know people who can wrap their head around that sort of long haul concept yeah. and just <clears throat> fall in love with the craft. I think, you know, it can be extremely rewarding and, and, you know, I look forward to a point where I can start to mentor people because I'm not now I'm, I'm, I'm a freelancer, you know, I, I just, I just work, but at some point I hope to get to a point where I can be responsible for new people coming in, fresh minds, fresh talents building them up and making them, you know, the next generation of sound designers. It's like you said too, it is such a, I don't think people are really aware of how creative it it really is. And, and maybe it's not, it's not like such a literal kind of creativity because like, you know, if you're a writer, you you write a line of dialogue and the the director doesn't like it, or you create a monster and they don't like the look of it, but with sound design, you have so much more freedom to kind of experiment you really do. You know, and it's just, it really is cool, it's, you know. And it's, it's open-ended. And like I said earlier, you know, people, you know, they have less sort of preconceived notions about how yeah. things should yeah. sound. Yeah. So yes. you bring That's more much, yeah. can sound it's an advantage. opportunities yeah. to, to, the, to the table. That aspect of it can be hugely rewarding. So, Jamie, is there anything that you're working on that listeners can look forward to seeing and hearing soon or in the future? Um, well, right now I'm at Skywalker, and so you know, you'll see those movies if whether you want to or not. <laughs> oh, 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 we will. Oh, we will. Uh, but the show that I just finished is really interesting. 
It's called Lost Ollie, and it's for uh, Netflix. And it's a four-episode animated series created by Shannon Tyndall. I don't know if you know Shannon, but um, Matt, of special interest to you, Shannon is also the director of the up-and-coming Ultraman. Oh, um, no. Oh, wow. Yeah, so this, this show was created by him and directed by Peter Ramsey, who um, he was the director of uh, the Spider-Verse movie. No. Oh, wow. Oh, no. The Oscar yeah, winning, right. Oscar winning uh, yeah. director of that. And, and the two of them together make this incredible team of just wonderful people. And I was the sound supervisor. I, ba- I basically did everything start to finish on this. I was, I was the editor, the Foley guy, the, the mixer and the final delivery guy. Wow. So I, I did a wow. one man show on the show. And the, the animation is done by ILM. It's just absolutely beautiful. It's like, it's like one of these, uh, I wish I could talk more about it, because, um, sure. I, but I can't, because right. I'm still under NDA. But sure. Is it coming it is, out soon? Is it? Uh... Uh, I hear a little birdie kind of chirped in my ear sometime in uh, August. Okay. Okay. Mm. On Netflix. Oh, and nice. it's uh, it's going to be a, a big thing. It's, it's a really, really special show. Cool. So cool. Uh, I, I hope people see that i'm sure they will because it's, yeah. it's i mean how do you how do you ignore something so incredible remind well, us <laughs> around the time that it's coming out yeah and we'll plug it again okay. yeah, yeah, yeah totally. look forward to seeing that yeah yeah, yeah. well you know you know that uh, with shannon and peter involved it's, it's something very special Cool. Well, Jamie, you have been something special yes. on this show. I want to yeah. want to awesome. thank you so much for for being with us. Just yeah. hearing your stories have just been terrific. I just uh, yeah. love talking about the so great much. heroes of of sound design, but you've just been wonderful. Yeah, uh, thanks yeah. thanks for uh, volunteering your time for our crazy it's a, show. It's an extraordinary pleasure. I, I've enjoyed this thoroughly. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. I say we have a toast. That's yes, true. we do. Yes, make to a... Jamie Scott. Oh, Lift your glasses, you. <laughs> everyone. Make a make a sound with your glasses. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> to Jamie and sound design. Ooh, sound <laughs> design. Yes. Right. Time for a listener shout out. Shout, shout out. out. Shout Listen out, to the out, sound out. of the shout out. The shout out. <laughs> this is the Wilhelm shout out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, Larry, what do you got? Well, I got to tell you guys, uh, I just want to thank everyone who voted for us for the Rondo Hatton Awards for for yes, Best Podcast. Yes, we were so yes. thrilled. We were so surprised as to how many people voted. I just want to let you know that, guys, this was our first time being nominated. Guys, yes. we won an honorable mention. Now, yeah. that is amazing. Now, now there are a few. There are a few other honorable mentions, and that is that is great. I, I never expected us to get as 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 high as we did. I'm delighted. But, but look, yes. the, the, the winner of the best podcast, according to the Rondos, was Gilbert Godfrey's Amazing Colossal Podcast. And look, that is a great yeah. podcast. A bless the man's heart. Uh, it's a, a wonderful show. But look, for the first time that we were nominated to get an honorable mention, I, I mean, I, I feel truly honored. I'm very happy. And I, I, I just want to thank the Rondo Awards for yes. 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 Sure. having us be part of this. And being and such every- good company. And every listener who wrote us in so we could get nominated, and certainly every listener who voted for us for the honorable mention. Yeah. Uh, be- yes. Because another another honorable mention was uh, Mick Garrison's postmortem podcast, which That's is right. huge. Wow. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a, it's a huge honor, and we really, really appreciate it. I also want to congratulate uh, Frank Dietz for becoming yes. uh, being inducted into the Monster Kid Hall of Fame. Uh, Way to Very go, well Frank. Congratulations. Yes. Good job, Frank. And let's remind our listeners that Monster Party merch is still available in limited quantities on our eBay store, which is Monster still? Party Store. <laughs> Believe it or not, there are, there are one or two items that you still might be able to get. One right or now. two items, yes, yes. Uh, yes. So, what's the first item? Well, it's the classic Monster Party logo glow in the dark t shirt available, available in large, men's large. I bu- you know what? Let me check. Uh, large, 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 uh, large. Yeah, just large. okay. And the uh, the Monster Party cloth PPE face mask. Yeah. Although now we're at the point where people don't even remember what PPE means anymore, but it's, <laughs> it could still be useful for a variety of things. Sure, and yeah, you could. And, you know, what you could do. You could put it over your mouth, and you could create new sounds. Ooh, <laughs> good, nice. And then give them to Jamie Scott. 
<laughs> you could do the Charlie Brown adults. <laughs> 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 And um, if you are a Patreon member and you order Monster Party merch, we will yeah. throw in free goodies courtesy of Jason Lindsay and Biff Bang Pow Toys and Ted Haynes, creature creator extraordinaire, friends of the show. They are such good friends. Look what they yeah. do for us. Yes. They're wonderful. It's wonderful. incredible. Uh, so you'll get these surprise goodies. It's going to make your day. And Matt, what can you tell us about this Patreon thing? What's that all about? Well, Patreon is this platform that if you sign up to it, what you will get is you will get bonus material from Monster Party. So this bonus material could be special Patreon-only audio episodes. We have a number of shows that we do on Patreon, including Monster Party Masterpieces Ooh. and Larry's Toy Time. Uh, yes. Always a classic. You get yeah. some Larry's stuff. And uh, yeah, no, it's always a good time. And we also have story collections that have been donated by my stepfather-in-law, John Bordeaux. And mm -hmm. those are always well-received. And then we have this ongoing saga <laughs> of our Japan trip. And uh, James, you've uh, been doing uh, an amazing stuff. job uh, putting this footage together. Raw footage from our trip. And, uh, you know, I don't know how much more we have of this, but it has been like experiencing the Japan trip over again. It oh, really, yeah. in, in the best of ways. And, and it makes me sad sometimes. It's like, God, we got to go back. <laughs> yes, we do. We so, yeah, do. there's that. And, uh, yeah. And who knows what other crazy shit we'll be coming up with <laughs> yes. to entertain you in the future when it comes to Patreon. Well, I mean, it sounds too good to be true. And frankly, it sounds a little pricey for what you're getting. <laughs> you scoff? That is my Wilhelm scoff. You're, you're, the, you're the laugher. <laughs> I'm the laugher. <laughs> hey, it's only $5 a month. Five what? bucks? No. Five you dollars. can't buy a canned laugh track for that price. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you can, but <laughs> but who knows what kind of quality you're getting. Yeah. You know? mm. yeah. But uh, yeah, so it's just $5 a month. And it will open the door. The giant King Kong gates <laughs> of goodness that will come into your life. So how does one become such a Patreon member? Well, all you got to do is you go to patreon.com, you click on Monster Party, you follow the instructions, and now it's happening for you. And hey, let's remind our listeners that we are on social media. We are on Facebook at Monster Party TV, and YouTube is also Monster Party TV. As of this moment, we are still on Twitter. <laughs> at Monster Party HQ is our uh, handle and Instagram, also Monster Party HQ. And hey, please take a moment, write to us, let us know your thoughts and feelings. Uh, we would really love to hear them and we will read them on the air. And we will not only read your review on the air, we will scream it. On that note, I am Matt Weinhold. I'm Sean Sheridan. I'm Larry Stroth. And I'm James Gonis. Keep America strong! And only watch films with great sound design. Isn't that right, Wilhelm? Ah! <laughs> How's it going, guys? It's going. I'm, I'm feeling, hey, I'm feeling there he sexy. Is. Oh, hey. Oh, hey. That, huh? Wow. Fancy. It's like we we're doing a podcast with like Alex Lifeson. Yeah. <laughs> I this mean, is, this is the spirit of the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I tell hey, you, one more post coming. Guitars, we have not only guitars in the background, but a, a beautiful blue light. How neat. Hey, it's this hey, recording hey, studio. Hey. You know, it's funny that you should mention Alex Lifeson because this Les Paul is actually the Alex Lifeson model. Uh, Les oh, my Paul. God. You can see that. His signature. Oh, look at that. Well, oh, my. Wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah. cool, huh? Great. Great minds. Great taste. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, we already man. knew this, right? Well, yes, we did. But uh, so, hey, what about you other guys? Are you guys Rush fans? Oh, I yeah. Hell yeah. John is, <laughs> I know. 
Uh, oh James, God. no, because no, moving, no, moving, no. Uh, moving pictures. Not since Gershwin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, hey, are you knocking? Gr- wait, are you knocking Gershwin? No, I'm are saying you- not since Gershwin has he caught up. I'm, oh, Randy I'm Newman. Old, he older, likes Randy older Newman. school. I love Randy. Newman. Is that wait? What was the? If I missed it, what was the rush? How did the rush? Thing well, because I mentioned, I said that uh, <clears throat> Jamie's studio reminded me of like you know like the rehearsal room for uh, Rush. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, moving pictures. I've probably listened to about eight billion times. I mean, that, that's eight a classic, classic, right? It's a perfect times. album. It perfect is. Album. Hey, Jamie, Red Barchetta, right? <clears throat> what about it? One of the best songs Greatest. ever written. <clears throat> oh yeah, you know that. The, the start of the solo, I don't know if you remember the video, but it goes down that like tube. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. I, I, I started getting high just so that I could experience that to its full extent. <laughs> yeah. yeah. In high uh, by the way, Jamie, I'm Sean. Oh, Hi, yes, Sean. that's Sean. And we got James, James Jonas, and then we got Larry Stroth. And, uh, and that's and then we got me. And so that's us. And there's no more hosts. Going up. <laughs> it is a, a pleasure to meet you all. Pleasure well, to meet you. Thanks for being here. You as Jamie well. is great people. Oh, cool. We, well, thank you. And I've, I've known been fond Matt of Weinhold you from for... the second I met you. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Uh, we met, uh, I, I did the math earlier, and it was 27 years ago that we oh met. Oh, my God. Jeez. Whoa. Wow. wow. That hurts. Shit, Sorry. Matt, how, the, how <laughs> old are you, man? Fuck. <laughs> man, you must be really old. I, yeah. <laughs> I started uh, trodding the boards, you know, in the, in the 30s. <laughs> and me and Eddie Cantor make the rounds. You no, know, you were the first kind of famous person that I ever met. I'm so sorry. No, it's, it's funny because uh, you, uh, I think at one point we were uh, watching you on Comedy Central. Oh, and I was like, okay. there's Matt. Oh, my God. And we were kind of freaking out. <laughs> Those were the days. I tell you, you know, you know he's gonna sh- sh- chase people away with a stick. I tell you, he's so big now. You know, when he watched oh. that red carpet, oh. man, people are going nuts. You know what? TMZ is on the other side of that door right now. <laughs> <laughs> I can't get enough of my your house. my antics. Yeah, really. yeah. <laughs> the the fast paced hedonistic lifestyle. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes I'll go to the kitchen and get a beer and a cocktail. Ooh, Ooh, wow. wow. Anyway, like, Jamie, welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, so you guys want to get into the weeds on, on like film nerdery here? Well, well yeah. Yeah. Okay. Will. wait, yes, yes. I, I right, tell you what, I, I tell you what, you. Uh, Jamie, if, if you, I'm, I'm sure you've listened to this show before. I have. Okay. So just, just to give you an idea, before we get started, what happens is Matt introduces the show with his little creepy voice and then we uh, introduce ourselves. We say what the topic is, and then we say, "And our guest is blah blah blah." And Matt's going to give a really big, big push, you know, a big, a big, a big Ladies introduction, and you know, to to Tonight. bring you in. Yes, well, kind of like that. But but once we get into it, you know, uh, Jamie, you have to understand too that there may be some people out there who who have no idea or no concept of what a sound designer, a sound mixer, re recorder is. So once we get started, I just want to see if we could just explain what that is for people before we get into <laughs> yeah, all the things a, that we not talk about. Well, well you know? I'll ask you kind of, you know, we'll I'll give you a little background of how we know each other. And then we'll get into what you do and you give us a, you know, just a, a primer of, of what exactly you do. And then we'll then we'll really get into it. Then, because, yeah. <laughs> And yeah. then we'll get Kitty Kelly on your ass, man. We'll get into the, yeah, you know, you know what I'm talking about. You know the stories. <laughs> but the you sound know, just, design stories. What happens when oh, a I know, the I studio know stays in the studio? I, I can add to that repertoire if you'd like. But well. I'll, I'll keep it G. Yes, please. G-rated. But, well, Jamie, here's the thing. Let's say, and just let you know, as we're recording, you know, if you say something like, Oh, yeah. And when I worked with that uh, George Lucas, he was a dick. Oh, wait a minute. I shouldn't say that. Uh, don't worry about it because uh, Matt will what? take that out. All you have to do is go We're back and go. Explaining oh, editing you, to the well, editor. Well, <laughs> well, the sound editor. I know, but uh, come on. David, I let me explain know. something to you. Did, we have a magic box. <laughs> oh, no, okay. Can take All the things right. that you okay. don't want okay. from the audio so, and put okay. them someplace so, else for safekeeping. But Jamie, so we're not live. The second thing is, look, man, if we're going long and then you'll send you go, oh, 
guys, I, I got to use the restroom. Can we stop from, of course, just, you know, we're all at that age. So it's like, <laughs> if you need to stop, just do this or whatever, we'll stop, do what we need to do, come back. And then we'll pick it up where we left off. Okay. Hey Matt, hey Matt just uh, speaking of sound, I'm using my, back to my old uh, Sounds much speaker. Better. That is better. Okay. Much better. Cool. Yes. Okay, cool. What does the sound guy think? Well, <laughs> yeah, really. Uh, it, I do actually have a question. Uh, is it going to sure. be a problem if I have my speakers on versus headphones? Are you hearing any like delay or feedback or anything like you that? You sound so, pretty good, so actually. Far, no. You, so, sound, you sound very, yeah. yeah. You sound pretty solid. We should have a room like what you have. That's what <laughs> yeah. I, I, I highly I'm recommend trying. it. I'm trying. Hey, man, and, you know what? One thing at a time. Okay. <laughs> it's okay. You got the room. You got a room, okay? J- Jamie's giving me some very good advice when it comes this is, to this is my my room here. I've got a look at that three inch screen. Oh, nice screen. Wow. And uh, you know, this is like my mixing board. Oh, look at that. Oh. Wow, so. lots of buttons. <laughs> but but Jamie, so it is many buttons. It, it it's windowless, correct? It's windowless. Just how we like it. I, it, it is windowless to the structure. I actually have windows into the recording room over there, but uh, yeah, for the most part, it's windowless. So there, there's no day daylight in or out here. This is uh, this it. is in your home that you do it all based in your home. Yes, your it's home? in That's my great. it's a converted garage. Yes. That's awesome. It's, be- nice. it's beautiful. Look how beautiful. I, it looks. I would I would not have known. <laughs> yeah. Have known. Oh. No, he's you know he's he's the real deal guy. He's he he's a pro. Mm. Yeah, he knows oh, yeah. who he's talking about. Yeah. You oh, got, I know some right. people. I you know do. some people. You do. All right. All right. Let's do it. So why don't we uh, launch into this then? Yeah. yeah. Cool. <clears throat> and uh, let me get all my little things up here. And Press record. What? Wait a minute. What? <laughs> oh, he's been recording. <laughs> do you tell oh. Jamie about our banter? Oh, yeah, that's true. That's a good thing to uh, mention here. Sometimes what we do is we take some of this conversation, this banter that we do pre-show, and we put it at the end. You're fine with that, I assume? It's like, or, like a little little, like a little, bonus. little extra. Yeah. Bonus you know. extras. Wow. Behind the scenes. I'm pretty Behind good at magic. self-censoring, you'll find out. So uh, there's <laughs> probably not going to be a lot of editing here. Oh, no, we oh. we. Uh, we have a lot of gotcha questions about oh. sound design. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, no. You better get ready. Okay. Okay. Bring it. Yeah, you thought Barbara Walters had it, but no, no, no. <laughs> no. Awesome. Thank you so much, guys. Awesome. I really appreciate that was really it. Good. Yeah. yeah, that, that was, was great, really cool. man. Also, the fact, awesome. that you, the fact that you're also really familiar with cinema history and old movies, oh, and that's, yeah. that, that's right. just a plus, you know? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Plus, right yeah. up our alley. Yeah, I'm such a nerd. I love this stuff. I, and I, I haven't listened to enough of you guys. I mean, every, every time I sit down, <laughs> no, to you listen, haven't. I get a call. <laughs> hey, we need this thing. <laughs> so, uh, right. Of course. Right. You know, Everyone is to ever, sound cool. And if there's ever a need for like four whiny movie nerd guys, <laughs> yeah, really. uh, you can you can use our, <laughs> our sounds. Whiny uh, film nerd Walla. If you ever need that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I would love to have that in my library. You never know. <laughs> I, I think we know some people. <laughs> what are you doing, uh, Larry? It's the sound of applause. I love it. Uh, <laughs> it, it sounds like a <laughs> toilet flushing. <laughs> Oh, I love what? It's yeah, I'm gonna go with toilet flushing. Yeah, it sounded uh, a little toilet flushing. Yeah, it did. For, no, all right, right. did, you, did guys, you get your files wrong? Uh, all right, just, you guys, <laughs> shut up. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna go listen in my own room. <laughs> all right, buddy. Well, uh, we we need to hang in Thank person. Thank you, Jamie. Are you going to Comic Con by any chance? Uh, no, no. Unfortunately, yeah. I'm okay. So booked. It's crazy. I'm yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm doubling up on two films right now. Oh, crazy. yeah. Wow. But great. Fantastic. Yeah. 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 It's exci- exciting times. Well, if you ever have time for lunch some day or night or. Man, I would love to. <laughs> yeah. And Let's if have you, night and lunch. If you, and if you talk to <laughs> Ren Kleiss, you just say, hey, I did this podcast with this guy named Larry Stroth for he worked at Midland Productions. Because <gasps> Ren. No. Did- oh, I'm oh, serious. Larry. I'm going to use that. I'm going to use that as my conversation. Start with <laughs> right. <him. laughs> yeah. Oh, Larry, the guy with the applause file. <laughs> yeah. No, no, he, no, no, no. He, yeah, he, he did the did majority. Did he ever of get out of the sanitarium? <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'll tell you what I'll, I'll post i'll post this on the skywalker slack and, and they'll, know. <laughs> good, good. they'll know about that right. i'm gonna listen to more applause <laughs> pretty flushy 
Uh, see, the problem is, is that I think it is maybe it's the volume because it because it, it it like Too high. it peaks and then it just sounds like <laughs> that was just like a a bird flying by your window. Yeah. Well, trust me, it 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 it's a pick me upper. You know. Is it and really? I, oh my! Oh my God! I imagine. You know what I imagine? This is what I imagine. Okay. They, it's at Comic Con in what's it? Uh, Hall H, and they go, okay, yeah. ladies and gentlemen. Here are the guys from Monster Party. Let's start off with Larry Strofe, and that applause goes, and I'm out there. I'm like, yeah, yeah, and then and then and now Matt Whitehold. And there's like a little, you know, some clapping. <laughs> wow. Okay. Wow. <laughs> Hey, you know what? It wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> uh, but it, I'm I tell telling you, when, you, when you've had an entire fairground full of people all say, fuck you. <laughs> I know. I've, you can I've, get you can get through anything. I know. And you know what, Matt? You have. I have not experienced that. And hey, my my hat is off to you, sir. No, no, no. I'm just uh, saying. I'm just saying. Toughens you up a little bit. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. I'm just, you know, you want to go home and cry, but I, yes, but a little pick me up. I tell you that applause, 14 minutes. It's like, oh, now, please, please tell me in all honesty that you haven't played that for 14 minutes. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) I want to, you know, to be a fly on the wall. In your <laughs> world, ah, you know, I, is is it really that interesting? Well, to you me, know, I, guess it, I guess it could. Uh, you you apparently think it is. You know, it deserves yes, fourteen yes, minutes yes. of applause, Larry. <laughs> <laughs>